All right, so um, I get the pleasure of introducing the next speaker. My name's Tom Fraser. I'm the director of the School of Natural Resources and Environment at the University of Florida, and I'm also the acting director of the UF Water Institute. So um, while these guys are getting things squared away, I'll, I, in the interest of time, I think I'll start the introduction. And it's really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Hank Losher today. Um, Hank uh, is by training uh, an ecosystem scientist and he's certainly well versed in, in the myriad issues surrounding not only big data, all right, but big science. At present, he's the Director of Strategic Projects and Program Developer for International Development at NEON, which is the National Ecological Observatory Network. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with NEON, I, I think I'd start by saying that NEON represents a significant investment by the National Science Foundation in infrastructure and technologies for the collection of um, what I would call eco-environmental data across the United States to assess the impacts of climate change, <coughs> excuse me, land use and invasive species on natural resources and biodiversity. I'm a little cold today. How about you guys? <laughs> I'm from Florida and I woke up and I was like, what's going on? Anyways. Um, but NEON's, from my perspective, again, is, is uh, it's a big deal. You know, we've invested projections anyways of about a half a billion dollars for setup costs and an annual operating budget of, of close to 100 million. It's not trivial. Um, I think NEON is the first observatory network of its kind, and it's des uh, designed specifically to detect and enable forecasting of ecological change at continental scales over multiple decades. Thousands of sensors deployed across domain sites from Puerto Rico to uh, Alaska will generate terabytes of data annually. So NEON, as I said before, is big science, but it's enabled by big data. And there are certainly challenges with NEON. There's challenges in the past, there are current challenges, and there will be more challenges. Um, but there are lessons to be learned. And it's in this light, actually, that we've invited Hank to come talk to us um, so he can share with us his experiences with the program and provide some insights into NEON as it moves forward and so how we all might learn some lessons uh, in ourselves moving forward. So with that said, Hank, take it away. Do we got this squared away? Thank, thank you very much, Tom. And thank you, for, um, everyone, for, for being here and thanks for the opportunity to be able to, to chat with you all ab about this. Um, as we're trying to gin this up, um, I'm going to take a, a perspective that's a little bit probably more conceptual at times and, and, uh, and talk about large-scale environmental research infrastructure, sort of a, a different type of, of beast that's, um, that's large and what that actually might mean in informing uh, local decision-making as well. Um, my first meeting about NEON and, and the, to give you a, a sense of the size and the, and the scope, my first meeting uh, was in uh, 1999 and 2000. Um, it went through several near-death experiences, as with many large-scale research infrastructure. Uh, that's a separate talk on near-death experiences of these type of projects. Um, it, uh, it is um, uh, highly reviewed by the National Science Board and uh, with oversight from the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, once we have a very, very rigorous review schedule um, and pass that review in 2009, um, then we start uh, constructing it. It's a five-year construction process where we have one more year to go. Um, and as um, facilities and infrastructure become built, uh, they become online and become operational. And part of what we have is already operational. Um, and, um, and so what I will talk about, let's see if I can figure this out. Is that the pointer? You may or may not see. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the societal imperative of why we're doing large-scale environmental um, studies. We'll talk about our grant challenges and how we um, stepped up this process of, of building uh, something of this magnitude. I'm going to give a very broad sweeps of our neon overview of our design. Talk a little bit um, about ecological forecasting, why we're doing this. Um, and what are the, the concepts or the philosophy behind ecological forecasting that we think are novel 
um, and then move into uh, uh, large big data interoperability and some international efforts. And then I'm going to lead off um, with some issues, challenges, and path forward as more of discussion points um, for, um, for Q&A and for um, kicking off additional discussions um, here at this meeting. Um, so we probably are very well aware that this is the era of big data. This is what this conference is about. Um, and I have several um, uh, uh, covers here, and um, I know Will had put up uh, some similar studies uh, in his, some of his first um, slides. Um, the take-home message here is, is that it's really um, uh, becoming a, uh, very well known across society, um, not just within governmental circles or in agency circles, um, but also at society as a whole are rec recognizing that this is an era of big data. Um, and we're seeing um, uh, planning documents and position papers developed from the executive office, um, in, as well as in Europe and Australia and elsewhere. Um, and this is becoming more and more um, um, uh, uh, a societal imperative, uh, an overall awareness, and thinking about the exact problems that we have here today in this room. How do we think about integrating and starting to build these large-scale um, data sets? Well, one of the, the concepts that um, is, uh, generates uh, a lot of discussion and a lot of effort are something that's called societal benefit areas. Um, you'll see this in planning documents um, within the White House, um, again, internationally. Um, and nine societal benefit areas have been um, decided. I'm not too sure quite how they all suss out, and nor do I really quite know, understand what the difference between weather and climate is. Um, uh, but how do we actually then think about building large-scale data within each of these societal benefit areas? What does that mean? And the concept of, of uh, essential variables comes to play. So what are the essential variables that start linking large-scale data within each one of these. So there's, there's, large, there's um, essential carbon variables in here. There's essential biodiversity variables in here, et cetera. <clears throat> um, this is a grand challenge for environmental sciences as determined by the National Academy. Um, the White House actually placed um, a large um, uh, uh, data, big data initiative to start generating what this discussion would look like across SBAs. Um, and how to, to, to at least conceptually link large platforms. Um, and, and it's also the start of the discourse that big data is a national resource um, and being able to communicate up um, um, through our, uh, our governmental and decision makings that this is really, really important national resource. The second part is that once we actually build, the vision is that once we actually build these type of large scale platforms, we're then able to ask not only questions within these societal benefit areas, but across them in ways that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, so really being able to look uh, in, in, in very much in towards the future of new questions that we don't even know what to ask yet, but being able to develop the facilities and the data structures to be able to ask them. So the questions of societal importance within and among these societal benefit areas, um, and that understanding really requires that integration of information. And lastly, and I'm going to circle back around and not spend a little bit of time on this, um, but in, in my lessons learned um, internationally, that to think about how to do this, it's really um, a change of culture. It's, uh, it's, it's having people-to-people -people contact and meetings like this that were actually um, evolving and having this discourse um, and changing that culture. And that is, uh, for me, much of the change and how that change actually occurs. Um, these are um, some quotes from uh, our, our executive branch. If you're not familiar, I strongly suggest um, pulling up the National Plan for Earth Observations um, that came out last year. Uh, and uh, it's well recognized at a very high level that fragmented federal investment among monitoring ecological change weakens our national our priorities. That there's a bond and a, a strong link between the uh, economic and environmental dimensions to societal well-being. Um, and while there's plans within agencies and among agencies to start thinking about this, look up around the room right now of the people next to you, because this is actually where the real work is being done, is as we are actually building these networks, building these new cultures, and, and pushing this forward. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about NEON, <clears throat> and hopefully the narrative will 
will we'll build as we go on. Um, part of that then is with the National Academy of Sciences through the NRC reports in the early 2000s, um, had two very uh, seminal reports. One are the grand challenges of environmental sciences, and the second is sort of a, an, an a vision of what the National Ecological Observatory Network could be. Um, and they actually identified seven grand challenge areas. Um, and you see them here, biodiversity, biogeochemistry, climate change, ecohydrology, infectious disease, and basic species are names. <coughs> and so uh, uh, we took that to heart. Uh, we went to the community, and it was a community-driven process of what does that mean? What, do you, what are the questions that you actually need to be able to address these type of large-scale grand challenge questions? And so from the community, this is our mission statement. This is what NEON does. How will ecosystems in the United States and their components respond to changes in natural and human-induced forcings, such as climate, land use, <coughs> and invasive species? across a range of time and space scales, and what's the pace and pattern of those, those processes? And how do the internal responses and feedbacks of biogeochemistry, biodiversity, ecohydrology, biotic structure and function interact with these changes <coughs> of land use and climate, and et cetera, and what's that ecological context? Now, <coughs> we probably will never ever be able to answer this question, these questions, but these are meant to be high-level guidance questions of how to build um, a design and a facility. And what you'll see there um, is that we've adopted the cause and effect paradigm explicitly. <coughs> what are the forcings? <coughs> what are those abiotic drivers of change? What are those responses? What are the organismal responses? What are the changes in biogeochemistry? And what are their interactions and their feedback? And being able to adopt a cause and effect paradigm as well as a spatial scaling strategy across the, the continent um, has been deemed by the National Academy as being truly novel. I wanted to talk just very quickly about what we mean about ecosystems and ecosystem states um, and how they potentially will change. <clears throat> um, so this is a um, conceptual diagram of the stability of an ecosystem as a ball on a plane. And you can see that, and here you can actually, the ball might move very, very uh, easily if there's a perturbation. Very small perturbation would change the position of this ball here, <coughs> as well as this might be one that would be considered very stable. So these are concepts that we use um, much more um, in, a in, in a conceptual way of being able to describe um, resiliency, adaptability, and transformability. Resiliency is the propensity of these balls or these ecosystem states to move from one state to another. Adaptability is their ability to resist or to adapt to particular circumstances while still maintaining that state. And transformability is actually moving energetically or that whole ecosystem structure and function to a new state. And these are some of the concepts that we use. But we also do that um, uh, <coughs> under the, under, um, the idea that uh, of classic disturbance ecology where <coughs> a disturbance such as um, storm events, hurricanes, uh, snow and ice, large-scale fire, etc., cetera, um, uh, uh, insect outbreaks, affect the biotic structure, the organismal structure, which in turn affects the resources and there's a feedback loop. <coughs> and that's a discrete disturbance. But as we also all know, <coughs> that we also have chronic disturbance. We've got increases of nitrogen inputs, um, temperature affects of sea level rise, uh, increases of population in CO2. So there's chronic resource al altercation. That actually affects the resources themselves, which then in turn affects the biotic components. This is a very different paradigm of what we potentially can expect in the future because all of our understanding and our theories are all based on discrete disturbance. And we have no new ways being to address con continual chronic um, alteration. And so these types of theories and concepts really can only be challenged across time and space scales with large scale integrated data sets. <clears throat> the other novel aspect of how we actually design NEON, and this might be really intuitive to many, um, is that we actually come up with our grand challenge questions, which you've seen, and we went to the community and thousands and thousands of people that we've asked, how would you address those, that question with your own specific hypothesis? And so we have a, a, lots of different environmental science questions. 
Um, and then we asked ourselves, well, what are the data that you actually need to be able to answer those hypotheses to address those grand challenges? Um, and then that says, well, then what type of requirements that we need to, to actually build to? What's the signal to noise? What's the accuracy that we would need for a particular type of sensing or type of organismal sampling? What's the spatial size that we need to have to have a certain signal to noise to be able to answer that question? And those are science, question, science requirements. And then how do we actually implement that technically um, flow to um, technical and design requirements? Now, this might seem really intuitive that requirements flow from the top down. And at some point, we collect data. And that data then flows back up to be able to addr address the grand challenge questions. This process, this design process, is very common for things like NASA satellites or for particle accelerators. This is entirely new and different for the, for the environmental sciences community. Um, no one has ever done it at this scale, and no one's ever moved from a hypothesis-based um, questioning or a hypothesis-based structure to a requirements-based structure. And it's not to say that we don't have questions. We clearly have questions, but we're putting it into a different context. We were forced to do that um, by the National Science Foundation because with, with that, we can actually now constrain our budgets, our schedule, our risk to actually build something like this. But now, um, now that it's imminent that, that it's being built and we're, um, we're somewhat operational, <coughs> this is the structure that we can actually say these are the actual sensing and the actual signal to noise that we actually have and how to interface that with other types uh, of organizations, whether that's your own study, if you want to be able to add things to it, um, if you want to integrate it to other different data platforms, if you want to be able to integrate it in, in different types of field platforms. So it gives us an incredibly robust, robust tool. My work internationally, now that there's act, um, other continental scale observing networks that are coming online, a lot in Europe, Australia, China, et cetera, this is the means by which we communicate. What are your requirements and how do we actually link that up? Um, so this becomes an incredibly powerful tool. <clears throat> we also went to the community and said, if you were to um, uh, assess uh, uh, the, the regional trends for a wildland site for ecology um, in your area, where would that be? And also, what are the questions that are most relevant according to those grand challenges that are, um, that are in your area? So we went to the, also to the Department of Energy, and we carved up the, the US into 20 ecoclimatic zones. And within each of those zones, we have a core wildland site that is depicted by um, uh, these black dots. And that, they're there for 30 years. Um, <coughs> the one here. Um, is actually uh, uh, right outside of Gainesville in, in Melrose at the Ordway Swisher. Uh, and then so we, we, the, the, we have two other sites um, per, um, uh, per domain. Uh, we're, we're very jargon rich, so I'm trying very careful not to speak in different acronyms and jargon. Um, but within each domain, we have two other sites. And again, we ask the community what would be the, the most relevant uh, ecological question for that domain. And here in the southeast, um, it was forest management around forest management and uh, restoration issues. How do we restore different ecosystems? So the other site is um, at the Jones Center, if anyone knows that, um, and Disney Wilderness Preserve. Another example in, uh, say, in the Pacific Southwest, uh, it, that came back as, as saying that we really don't know um, the effect of the snow rain transition and how that's changing with land use change and changing the boundary layer dynamics that in turn is, is affecting snowpack um, and the water resources that are in the, um, in the Sierras. So we have an altitudinal grade, oops, have an altitudinal gradient to be able to assess that. Um, so across the continent, we have um, other uh, ecological domain, uh, uh, ecological um, gradients that are embodied across it. Um, and some of those include um, agricultural themes, climate themes, um, eco-hydraulic, forest systems, invasive biology, et cetera. Um, across their sites also, we have, uh, an, uh, um, so that's a total of 97 sites. Um, and uh, at 36 of those, we have explicit um, aqu uh, aquatic sites that we also measure. 
um, and they are, tend to be first order uh, and low order systems that also then map to different types of um, hydro periods across the continent. Again, I was gonna say we're acronym rich. So at, at these sites, we have different science teams or science areas that we actually then sense uh, what we're doing. We have a suite of organismal ecology, and that's primarily human observations in our bio archive. We have suites of automated instrumentation. Um, we have an aquatic system that is a combination of both human observations and, ins and instrumentation. Um, and then to take that, um, that information that's local and being able to scale it um, at the area that we can actually link to other s explicitly spatial data sets, possibly from the US government, like um, satellite-borne data, MODIS data, aqua data, et cetera. Uh, we have an airborne observation platform, and we integrate that um, at higher and higher levels with our data products um, and different types of um, other analytical packages that we call our land use analysis package. Um, so a little bit more specifically, our fundamental in sentinel unit, our FSU, our human-based observations. We have whole suites of data products on biodiversity, population dynamics, productivity, um, ecohydrology, biogeochemistry. Um, the, our data product lists are large, um, so if you're interested, um, I'd be happy to point you in the right direction, but you can find them and you can actually access our data at our, on our web portals. Um, and our, we have um, data product catalogs that then also describe all the types of data that we are, we're collecting. So here I'm just giving a broad overview. Our fundamental instrument unit um, is tower-based. Um, uh, again, co-located with all of our organismal sampling. We have uh, measurements on physical and chemical climate forcings that include things like NO, NOY, um, full range of oxygen isotopes in water, so we can look at source and sink dynamics. Um, uh, lots of meteorological scalars and fluxes. So in other words, we look at how whole ecosystems breathe in real time using sound waves and lasers. Um, and we can see how much CO2 is being uptaken um, and water um, being emitted in real time using eddy covariance, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, and to give you an idea also then of the amount of data that's generated at one of these sites, um, it's about 50 terabytes per year, and we have um, almost 100 of these sites. So it gives you a, a scope of just this type of instrumentation of how much data that generates. The towers are, tend to be very iconic. Everyone says, oh, look, you've got a tower site, um, and that's what it is. It, I also want to say that you know, our, our, in our statement, in our mission statement, our grand challenge statement, um, that uh, we want to look at the pace and pattern across scales, and towers, even though they're in a single place, we're actually measuring many different types of scales. We're measuring the synoptic incident scale, we're measuring the microclimate scale, the, the amount of scale that, that the vegetation and the structure is actually modifying the local climate, um, and the flux scale. There's, it's a moving, um, a moving plume that we actually measure across the, the, the ecosystem that can go out several kilometers. And of course, then also the soil scales. Our, in, our aquatic reaches, um, again, are low and first order streams and ponds, and they're designed to look at the connectivity with the terrestrial environment. Um, and in the stream reaches, we have an, um, uh, an observational stream reach, and we also have uh, an experimental stream reach. Um, measurements like metabolism, um, re aeration distances, um, all, all the abiotic drivers, light, temperature, and the so forth. Um, this is actually here at Barco Lake out at Ordway Swisher. Um, it's one of the, our first um, platforms that we've actually um, put out in lakes. Um, and this is uh, not just a prototype, but this is up and running and data is being collected right now. <coughs> our airborne um, system, we have got three aircraft. We, plan, uh, we are flying um, all of our sites right now at times of peak pro productivity. Um, so uh, whenever that, that occurs um, in the summer. Um, and it consists primarily of, of two, um, uh, uh, two instruments. Uh, one is a high resolution imaging spectrometer um, that returns the irradiances from all the ecosystem um, and a downward facing waveform LIDAR. Um, linking these two sets together, and this is modeled after the Carnegie observation uh, platform at Stanford, 
uh, what that does is um, the imaging spectroscopy um, returns different irradiances, and those can actually be turned into things like foliar nitrogen content, foliar water content, uh, 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 other, other metrics of productivity and water use. <coughs> and you combine that then with the canopy mapping, the structural mapping, and our DEM, um, and you can then build out actual real maps of whole ecosystems and whole forests um, as a function, in this case, of uh, foliar nitrogen. You can see that there's a much higher foliar nitrogen in this, this ecotone area between um, these, this happens to be Ordway Swisher. This is local data, this is real local data. High, um, pine woods in the back, flooded prairies in here, um, and then the ecotone hardwood hammocks, you can see it's got the highest productivity um, in terms of foliar nitrogen. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> we are charged to enable an understanding and forecasting by providing all of these data. Uh, we are data producers, um, and, uh, and we're looking for user communities um, at, at that forefront. Um, we do this by supplying um, informational infrastructure, consistent, long-term, continental, multi-scale data sets for research and education, um, and the physical infrastructure, that research platform for investigator-initiated uh, sensors. So we also have uh, the capability of adding other sensors. Um, like I said, also, uh, we have things like three aircrafts. We only need two. You can request that third aircraft to fly over your sites to expand and to connect to the large-scale data sets that we're generating. Um, and so if we want to talk a little bit more offline, I'd be happy to discuss that. Um, but I would also be remiss in, in it doesn't look like it's working. Oh, there it is, sorry. Um, in, in that um, we also have lots of other structures. We have a, a very active education and outreach group. Um, we have a, a state-of-the-art calibration lab uh, that's very important for interoperability, which I'll mention in the future, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that could be requested um, that we should talk about at some point. We provide that infrastructure. <coughs> so if we are to provide an infrastructure to enable an ecological forecasting, we had to actually define what we actually meant by ecological forecasting. And so bear with me for a second. I don't know if anyone has ever seen this before. But this is real data. This is the NOAA forecast skill of how well they can actually uh, predict the pressure fields across the whole continent at 500 millibar. That actually dictates the synoptic scale weather patterns across the US. <coughs> and in, in 1955, their skill level was around 22%. And now in, 19, in 2015, it's a little bit over 80%. Um, and so this is, th this is um, the forecast at 36 hours, and this is the forecast at 72 hours. Now, what's really interesting here is that there's no huge stochastic jump here uh, when 3,000 new weather stations came out in the 60s. There's no huge stochastic jump here in the 70s when weather satellites came on board. And there's no stochastic jump here um, in the 2000s when supercomputing came on board. The way that they actually integrated and increased this um, forecast skill is by integrating theory with their models with predictive forecast, challenging those, con th those forecasts with observations um, in an iterative capacity. Um, now, uh, that might seem very logical to us today, but um, if you're talking to other research groups or um, other agencies, they say, oh, we just do experiments, or oh, we just do observations, without necessarily the goal of ecological forecasting. Um, but the robustness of this model of being able to iterate um, theory, model, forecasts um, for ecological science is actually fairly new. Um, we all say that we might do it or think about it, but actually explicitly saying that this is the concept of how we're moving forward in ecological forecasting to enhance our skill, um, this is fairly novel. The part that's missing, um, and, and Noah doesn't necessarily need this, is the role of experiments, and clearly, <coughs> What we, um, 
what we're experiencing in environmental sciences right now, particularly um, in, in light of chronic disturbance, like I mentioned earlier, um, are nonlinear stochastic processes, things like tipping points, uh, temperature sensitivity, susceptibility to drought, et cetera. So we need to be able to use experiments to elucidate these, these future conditions and, and integrate it into the observations and theory um, and forecasts. So that calls for um, giving uh, estimates of system state, information on process level parameters. We need to have those experiments to elucidate those unknown and nonlinear processes. And, the, and we also need to have those observations then collected systematically over time and space to challenge these forecasts. This is novel um, for a para uh, novel paradigm for ecosystem and ecological research. Now, I've been giving this, these two slides um, in one form or another for a number of years. Um, and um, I also realized that, that while this is what NEON does, and this is really novel, and it is really important in pushing it forward, it's not necessarily what's needed when we're thinking about analytics and applied components. That what also what we need to be thinking about um, uh, around ecological forecasting is being, being able to com better communicate as scientists, as academicians, in engaging in this process, the concepts of risk and uncertainty. Um, and also along with that is to be able to de determine and be able to communicate not our science in terms of absolutes, but in terms of decision-making spaces. And that is also very, very foreign for us to try to think about. Um, and maybe there's some more questions around how we might think about doing that. Um, but, um, but again, uh, this is sort of a, this is a, this is a frontier talk, right? That's why we're here and we're chatting. <coughs> now, here's Earth Observation Networks. So we're very big in infrastructure. We've got very little on-site experience and marginal site-specific understanding. And there's very few of us, right? There's the integrated carbon observing system in, in Europe. There is the terrestrial ecosystem research in, in Australia. Um, and so they're really important that they're very strong, large data sets, large amount of data. We're now starting to think about how do we actually ask questions that span whole continents. Um, and I can give examples of those if, if you would like. Um, but we also are in, in the federated world of lots of other types of environmental and, and aquatic and ecological research. Coordinated distributed experiments, long-term research networks, and large amounts of, of PI-driven research, all with their different levels of on-site experience, infrastructure, <coughs> and site-specific understanding. And so the question then becomes, again, um, this is from an infrastructure standpoint, but how do we start thinking about integrating all of these together, um, both in terms of physical infrastructure and the informational infrastructure? Um, so that comes up with the concept of interoperability. Again, if we read many of those planning documents that I showed in my very first slide, they all say, oh, we need to be interoperable. Well, what does that really mean? And how do you have that con conversation? So the interoperability fabric is the, it's what's between all of these large-scale observation systems and what are the analytics and the applications that we want to be thinking about of, of actually generating. So how do we actually make these disparate data sets interoperable? Um, how do we actually um, make interoperable data then into applications? And it's really up for, for us to figure that out. So we've defined interoperability in terms of scientific utility. Now we might think about it in a very different way if we're thinking about um, out outreach components um, or with our uh, educational um, uh, goal. But for us, the way that we're delivering data, we really want to be able to identify what do we mean by interoperable so that we can actually put real boots on the ground activities to be able to make um, uh, different platforms and different research activities interoperable. First is how do we actually align our science questions, our hypotheses, our requirements, our mission statements. This actually defines the joint scope of how we actually can work together. Uh, what we have to offer, what you have to offer, and where those gaps are, where we actually need to think about putting additional resources um, to do that. So we can ask then what must be done to ask a particular question or for a particular focus or to join particular research um, infrastructure. The second is traceability of measurements. Um, so again, that's the epistemological question. How do we know what we know? 
Um, so the use of standards, recognized standards, first principles, best community practices, um, know and manage towards uh, the signal to noise that you're after for whatever phenomenon and process that you're after. And uncertainty budgets, and I'll get back to that in a second. The other is algorithmic processes and procedures. It's fine if I have a data product of say, um, uh, metabolism length scale for first order streams, and you have a different algorithm to do that. That's fine, but to make it consistent and compatible, we actually have to then compare, intercompare them and to understand what their relative uncertainties are. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because the future and the state of the art of integrated models is through Bayesian approaches or data assimilated pro approaches where we need to know what the uncertainties are a priori, and then we can actually model that up, up front. So, um, whether you're looking at the NOAA forecast skill that I showed up before or other predictive ecological models, um, the state of the art are Bayesian approaches and we need to know what those uncertainty budgets are a priori. <coughs> the fourth component is informatics. Now, many of you probably have worked in different levels of informatics. Um, um, I lump a lot of things into informatics. Um, I run several large projects around informatics. Um, and um, I've put a couple here, but I've actually s spelled them out in a different way. <coughs> so one, um, specifically what we mean are um, data in, in metadata formats, to make sure that they're transferable um, and, uh, and standardized. We use the ISO 19115 um, compliances. Persistent identifiers, everybody knows DOIs, digital object orient, uh, uh, dif <laughs> digital object identifiers. Um, but when we're thinking about time series data, how do you then have, uh, as part of our scientific premise of reproducibility, how do you pull a specific data set um, and be able to identify exactly that length of data set if it's part of a time series? And, and also, how do you then change that, that persistent identifier if that time series is concrete and augmented? Um, data policies, open source, community acceptance are what we're moving towards more and more, um, and there are hybrids for different business models. Data management plans, the, all of the U.S. agencies are now manda mandated to have data management plans. They're not aligned in any way, shape, or form. Data sovereignty, if we're moving across geopolitical boundaries, intellectual property rights and discovery tools. Now, I've left ontology, semantics, and control vocabulary because this is actually one of the places, at least in biodiversity and environmental sciences, um, that UF is actually considered a leader and is actually pushing that frontier very strongly. And I'm gonna give you an example of, uh, of, uh, of uh, something that uh, we, I personally have come up with. So um, one of the, the measures of ecosystem productivity would be is litter fall, how much litter is produced, how you collect that. But there's no real way of, of quantifying or, or categorizing or putting that into a controlled vocabulary of what litter fall is from one site to another or from one research to another. There's no standardization, there's no best community practices to do that. And that's sort of a simple thing to sort of wrap your head around. A more complex thing um, is the idea that um, uh, we, are, we, NEON, is actually measuring the presence and absence of uh, infectious disease, spe specifically um, for this particular data product, um, vector-borne diseases of mosquitoes. And so how we actually do that is we collect lots of mosquitoes at all of our sites, we grind them up, and we do DNA analysis on them. And we then look at the presence and absence of hantavirus, uh, of West Nile virus, um, and dengue. Uh, there's no word for that crushed up swath chunk of sample of mosquitoes, what do you call it? How do you put that into a searchable ontology? There's no way of actually doing that. <clears throat> the place where these components of, of interoperability and, um, uh, and informatics is, is being played out uh, in the worlds that I work in are um, other large scale um, forums. Uh, international forums um, and across other large-scale research infrastructures. So um, I, I work with space weather, geodesy, seismology, biodiversity, um, coastal sciences, um, carbon, uh, etc. 
and um, the places where we have these discussions are, are um, other forums, Research Data Alliance, um, uh, GEO, if anyone knows, GEO Group on Earth Observations, the Belmont Forum, ESIP, which is the Earth Science Information Partners. Um, and I, I encourage a dialogue here of how do we actually bring them into this discussion um, and into this group and vice versa. Um, I think this is very powerful and untapped resources of how we're actually thinking about working together and integrating our cultures together as well as the informatics that we bring to bear. <coughs> I'm gonna talk about two models that I, that I, I see um, with research infrastructures. Uh, one is the, the web crawling um, or the, the web, um, uh, web brokering um, activities. Um, and this is really busy. Um, and it basically says that there's a, um, there's a, 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 a system, a, a broker, that's able to um, know where your data is and pull it in and federate it in, in a different way. That then requires a registry program. So if you have your data um, and your informatics and your met metadata um, platforms and your data management plans, et cetera, you place those into a registry um, and what your standards are and it automatically brings it all together according to, a, to those the semantics and ontologies that you've identified with for your data set. Um, this, um, uh, the early stages of this, at least um, for on, on the group on Earth Observation Systems of Systems um, was kind of clunky. Um, it's gone through several different um, iterations. Uh, it's supported by the UN um, as well as um, lots of different governments have treated onto it. Um, and so this is one tool that is continuing to grow uh, and, uh, and there's different flagship and different disciplines, uh, water being one of them, uh, of how to, to bring together and federate large scale data sets. The other, um, and this is uh, the AMP lab, uh, this is a medical example, um, and that is actually coming up with a system architecture ahead of time and understanding um, and being able to say uh, uh, what each one of these different analytical packages are um, and then partnering public and private uh, to be able to realize that. So becoming, coming up with a system architecture ahead of time and then modularly being able to uh, assess the analytics and describing their interrelations and the interoperability, or the interrelations and the interfaces uh, between these inter, in, in, uh, between these analytics in, in a larger cyber infrastructure space. Um, this has proved to be an incredibly strong model. Um, it's it's gleaned um, uh, several hundreds of millions of dollars to step this up as a prototype with large public and private enterprises, including Google, Microsoft Research, etc. So this model has actually gained a lot of traction. Um, and a lot of optic. And I think this is a, a very strong model to think about for environmental sciences. And I'm starting to see these building block approaches starting to emerge. <coughs> okay, so um, some take home messages, um, things that I haven't talked about. Um, environmental data and uh, aquatic data is extremely heterogeneous um, from images to spatial and time scales to different types of signal to noise generated across a variety of different platforms. It's long-tailed. There, there are lots of, of smaller data sets that might be incredibly relevant that we don't know how to mine and how to pull in unless we have things like um, data registry processes. Um, and multiple use, how do we actually augment um, and build upon the accessibility of these long-tailed data for more and more um, uh, use. Something I have not talked about, uh, we had recently uh, run um, uh, a large international um, conference um, this sponsored by the National Science Foundation to ad readdress the grand challenge questions. Are they still valid or not? And are there new grand challenge questions uh, that we should start thinking about? And it was, a, it was three days. It was an incredibly um, active and dynamic workshop. We're having some papers come out of, out of it. Um, and one of the things that was recognized are things like the IPCC report that already has some ecological forecasting in it. Now, I'm a big proponent of the IPCC report. Um, however, those forecasts that are go out 25, 50, 100 years actually also does it a really large disservice and that disenfranchises the public and, the, and, um, and many decision makers of why do I have to make a decision now if the uncertainty is 100% and it goes out 50 to 100 years. 
Why should I change my behavior on the coast today? And so one of the challenges that we don't know how to do is short-term ecological forecasts from the year to the five-year time span and being able to develop that trade space and that understanding around that. So that might be sea level rise, that might be uh, flow regimes, that might be when, uh, when is the summer onset next year, uh, the summer onset of drought next year go actually going to occur. We don't know how to predict that. We don't know how to predict leaf out in the spring, uh, which has huge bearing on food security, how I make my, my natural resources decisions. We don't know how to do short-term ecological forecasts. Um, Large-scale environmental data is here, but interoperability, those searchable platforms, those um, applications and analytics, they're all lagging. That's why we're here. That's why we're having this discussion. I'm stating the obvious, um, but um, uh, it's good to state the obvious at times. And I'm seeing more and more of, of the model of the building block. How do we do small, manageable pieces of this larger puzzle? Um, and institutions are becoming much more of that middleware between large-scale environmental data sets and those applications. Um, and this is, I think, uh, new business models, new hybrid business models, public and private, and we see lots of different players. I said in the beginning of my talk, there's large expectations for societal benefit. Um, again, that's the, what we are charged to do. Um, integrating our environmental data is truly a frontier science, and we should all recognize that. It's not just our day-to-day -day grind, but this is a frontier science, and it's, and it's a grand challenge. Um, and, and, and my work around, um, I'm really seeing that um, a big piece of it is how do we change the human capital? How do we change the cultural capital that we bring to bear? How do we actually uh, bring together and evolve the broad adoption um, and evolution of these cultures to use large-scale data still is a challenge. Um, and uh, this takes time, and we should recognize that. But person-to-person, -person, people to people contact um, is extremely important. Um, and something we, I don't know if we're, we're gonna be talking about here at this meeting, how do we train and educate new co cohorts of users and that we all should be taking, our, taking leadership. And with that, I will hopefully go to the next slide. And thank you for your time and, and, and hopefully I had an interesting discussion here. I was saying is that it's obvious, and I said this in the beginning, it's a, it's a huge investment um, by our federal government, and I want to know uh, how the users of this data are, are reacting to it, are, are they taking advantage of it, what is the feedback, uh, what are their problems that they're experiencing, will they make changes? Uh, great, great question. Um, we fully expect uh, things like uh, data portals, accessibility, um, how we report data, that's going to evolve and, it, and uh, we have resources budgeted to make sure that that happens. Um, in terms of um, uh, building this, um, our ability to reach out and engage the community has always fallen short compared to the amount of, of time and resource that we need to actually build it. And um, our guidance from the National Science Foundation is always to look inward and to build it and make sure that, that, that we need to build it. Um, with the caveat that we engage the community um, with workshops, with advisory boards, technical advisory boards, et cetera. And that has been um, throughout the design period until about, um, uh, two, about two or three years ago, um, where now we're able to engage in having a bit more b bandwidth um, to engage with the community. Um, and um, large early adopters are not surprisingly young graduate students are jumping on this left and right because they actually see that this is a, as a, as a um, um, as a frontier and part of their career. Um, we are starting to, to, to work and, and have conversations of what it would look like to have a, a public and private enterprise uh, to use the data. So a synthesis center um, uh, is um, gaining a lot of traction. Um, and then since we're, you know, we swim in a sea of large scale infrastructure, other large scale infrastructures have that same problem. Um, and so a lot of our discussion of how do we um, work and engage with the user co 
communities are in conjunction with Australia CERN or China CERN or, um, or the European components. Um, and there'll be more and more opportunities to engage with us um, in the coming years. We've got resources and, um, and new projects that we're stepping up for broader engagement. I'm a user of data all the time. Uh, I work on large projects. And so almost always uh, we'll look at what's available on the broad scale and use that for content. Then we zero in and always collect type specific data. I'm curious who you see as the primary users for this data and for the tools that you make available and how you expect them to use it. it it's large. Um, I, the primary users are going to be. Um, probably twofold. Um, one, um, this opens up a whole new world of how do we ask continental scale, regional to continental scale, scale questions. Um, how do we scale up in, in those, those activities? Um, uh, agencies are really interested in that questions. Graduate students are, are really interested in that question. It's called macro, uh, macro system ecology. Um, and how do we actually start thinking about asking questions across continents? which I can give you some examples which are, are very interesting. Um, so we have this one platform and we're thinking, and a lot, half of our users will probably be thinking about how to scale up. The other half, just like yourself, or how do we actually take that contextually and scale down, uh, whether that is in time or in space. Um, and uh, again, um, I, I see both of those being very active research areas. Um, one more theoretical um, and the other much more applied. Sure. Yeah. No. So it's a uh, um, with all of our design and research development, um, it's a half a billion dollars to construct. We're almost done constructing it. Uh, we have sites from the North Slope of Alaska in Barrow and at Tulik all the way down to Puerto Rico, um, and we have sites in uh, Hawaii all the way out to New England and everywhere in between. Um, and they're they're distributed according to what the research community came back and said what was important. Um, now they're fixed. And I fully acknowledge that there might be really strong and important questions that we can't ask, address with our fixed resources. So we have um, those, um, those themed sites. Um, if they can stay there for the duration of NEON, but if they're not collecting data that's important, the community like yourself can say, well, we want to move it to another site. And we have resources to do that. We also have what's called mobile platforms that you can request. So if there's targets of opportunity, things like a flood event that you want to be able to, to assess really rapidly, we can come in very quickly and, and assess that for you regionally, or a forest fire, et cetera. So spatial extent and the dynamicism of our design is flexible while we still have fixed, fixed sites as well. Um, uh, our operations um, is for 30 years. Um, and that starts uh, next end of next fiscal year. Um, and so uh, we're guaranteed um, operational funds as part of the agreement for the construction funds for a 30-year period. <coughs> and we fully anticipate there'll be upgrades on cyber infrastructure and models and, you know, as things go on, or instruments, et cetera, as things go on. But um, you've got a follow-up? Yeah, um, do you leverage an existing monitoring network as you do that? Yes and no. So the National Academy um, and um, uh, the National Science Foundation, when we're designing this, did not want to have this design contingent on anybody, any other agency delivering something to it, right? But we also recognize that we can't swim in that sea without engaging and, and partnering. So many of the sites overlap with other existing, um, other existing agency projects. So we are at multiple sites that are USDA um, ARS, uh, Agricultural Research Stations. Uh, we have other ones that are at NOAA Climate Reference Network Stations. 
Uh, we're at other ones that are at uh, long-term ecological research stations and at critical zone observatory sites uh, and so on and so forth and, so, and American, uh, uh, DOE Ameriflux sites. And so with that, then we have a mechanistic linkage of having our measurements right at the same place as their measurements so we can extend the sphere of influence if there are relevant questions using multiple different platforms. Does that, that make sense? I want to follow up on that. So, I mean, sure. if, if you do want to, for example, take advantage uh, of an event, all right, and you want to uh, move some instrumentation, <coughs> um, who, who do you make the request to? Do you make it to NEON? Do you make it to the National Science? Yeah, it's, yeah it's, a, it's a really important question. Um, and we've been working with the National Science Foundation for quite a while to, to come up with the process to do that. Um, it will, um, and hopefully we're going to unveil that soon. Um, it's modeled after the um, use of the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, and so there's a feasibility component. There's a feasibility review that NEON does. Can we actually do it or not, right? And what that cost would, would occur. Um, and then for you as a PI, there would be a scientific merit review. And that merit review would be um, uh, similar to the rapid um, proposals that would be at, at NSF. And so then if you get funded and awarded, NSF gives you the, the money to be able to do the science, and NSF gives us the, the money to actually implement it and, and execute it um, on the sites. So what, what the I one of the other rationale that I didn't talk about for NEON is that they want scientists and engineers to do more, spend more of their time doing science rather than setting up sites. So it's developing that infrastructure. So it's, we facilitate you doing your science. <laughs> I wanted to pick up on your compelling point about the interrelationship between data collection and data analytics and the development of uh, taxonomies and, and especially as we're moving into an increasing environment where we're less and less, let's say, data limited in terms of the next generation of breakthroughs and more analytically limited or creatively limited. Um, I spent five years during the MREOC phase as a director of your sister facility, Earthscope. And I work very closely with Earthscope. Um, we had very strong community support for data collection, data archiving, portals, distribution. When it came to developing the next generation of creative analytical tools, I, I don't mean data visualization, I mean real sort of data analysis tools, we, we could not for whatever reason, get the, the community to come together and agree to support on that. It was still seen, that's where people wanted to retreat back into their individual labs and their individual offices and their individual groups of graduate students. How is NEON going to break through that? How, how, how are you able to get people to get beyond just a data collection and distribution facility and get that community input to develop the analytical tools that are really required to exploit this amount of data? No, no it's a real pertinent question. Um, and, and very truthfully, um, that's right where we are right now. It's trying to, we're asking ourselves that same question. Um, we um, engage in multiple different forums um, to be able to make that data available, uh, but, to, but, to but, to, um, uh, but to bring together the different communities for specific purposes, for those applications. Uh, we're engaging with synthesis centers, um, specific research groups that self-organize, so RCNs, um, and helping support RCNs or the, the like. Um, different universities, uh, different initiatives that we are targeting to identify early hanging fruit rather than trying to do a large shotgun approach initially. Um, and hopefully we'll be, 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 yeah, be, be building momentum around that. Um, but that's our current strategy. We're not fully operational yet. Um, and I think it um, actually, NEON presents a little bit of a different um, problem than EarthScope, um, uh, both IRIS and UNAFCO, um, uh, because uh, their communities are already extremely well um, built around how to use research infrastructure where the environmental and ecological communities, this is the first of its kind, and they still don't even know really what it means and what, what it means to them for their science. So we have to overcome that burden uh, on, top of, on top of that.
Sure, I asked. I know what the question is. In interoperability is different from being able to produce data and make it available. So we have got data; it's it's available. But but the degree by which it becomes interoperable is the degree by which those four points that I, I laid out are actually met, and real tasks can, can be can be put towards that. So that would be how you would integrate our data with somebody else's or your data with somebody else's. Um, the metrics of um, the actual data, whether or not you can a answer a question or not, um, what informed our designs, our temporal coverage, um, is um, trying to assess what the known signal-to-noise ratio is. It's known what we know today um, and or that we can model today in terms of accuracy and precision. So how much data that you would actually need to be able to be accurate and precise to be able to use the, the appropriate statistics to answer your question. Um, and so we've, we have metrics to be able to assess what our design is, and now we're collecting the data to test that. D does that make sense? Okay. To follow up on that, have you defined a, sort of a library of science questions that you are, you know, measuring this data against? Or, you know, is, how are you anticipating what the science questions are? Uh, um, well, so we asked the community for those science questions, and we've, gen and we've generated thousands of them. We had cataloged those for our National Science Board um, review. Um, I don't know if they're publicly available or not, and one of the reasons is that we didn't want to give any particular research group competitive advantage over another if they came up with that question. Um, and so uh, uh, we used it for our, our internal discussions and working with um, the National Science Foundation. Um, but yes, we did generate lots of different questions, but that's somewhat, we lumped them together. So say if it's around productivity, around carbon productivity, we want to know um, uh, within, say, 20% of the spatial mean for litter fall, since I used that as an example earlier. And depending on, on how many plots that we actually put out there, it becomes a, an end size sampling um, uh, an analysis. Uh, and so that's a very s easy thing to be able to assess what that signal to noise is and how that would e extend to our, our design. Um, that, that would be a fascinating, day, fascinating database to see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, the, a, as well as um, what we do make available are all our requirements, which are also pretty incredible. Um, so you've been patient. Yes. <laughs> uh, this morning. You've got EPA, you know, Fish and Wildlife, NOAA, other, other organizations that have this huge data collection. I was wondering if they were cooperating with you because it seems that that would be a perfect match or a perfect fit if you could somehow align some of the, the data they're generating and feed it into your system and make more of these global. For example, I think you have the really cool power to create quite a of great data. I know EPA is interested in mercury contamination all the way up to that position. You could take and collaborate with them and have a national mercury TMDL to solve the problem, figure out who needs to do what exactly. to reduce mercury over the next you know, 20, 30 years, or whatever. And I just, it seems like a perfect fit. And I was wondering if they're cooperating. Um, yeah, so, so I heard two questions. One is uh, cooperating on, on information, the other is on the physical infrastructure. Um, uh, yes, um, we've got a big sandbox. A lot of people want to play with us. Um, the, the problem right now is that we are extremely focused on trying to build it um, and, and, and develop the plans for engagement and to make sure those lines of communication exist now, and they are. Um, so EPA is a perfect example. They want to put methyl bromide sen sensors on all of our towers, right? So um, uh, we, we work very closely. We've got offices in D.C. Um, and communicate and engage with them on lots of different levels. Now, um, that is for the physical infrastructure. 
We're also at a lot of agency property. We don't own any property, so we're at Forest Service land, we're at BLM land, et cetera. Um, and so they're very anxious to, to know what that data looks like as well for their own internal purposes. Um, and, then, um, and then lastly, I had mentioned the eco form of the 200 million White House initiative. That was specifically designed to address that question. How do you get all of them to talk to each other and make sure that they have a har homogenized or harmonized data management plan? Um, or um, how do we address those other issues of, of interoperability? Um, and uh, that's, as you can imagine, a harder conversation to have. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. Um, uh, I sit on a couple of interagency working groups also. Um, um, this comes up a lot. Um, and st really strong players are USGS, um, particularly the Aero Center, uh, US Forest Service, um, NASA and the ROSES program, um, and DOE and their terrestrial ecology program. Wait, I see Stan standing up, which means we're due for a break, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, Tom, you know. I, I, I had this just a minute. Um, <coughs> I was just interested in seeing the growth of like the comments and instrumentation evolve with this as far as like robotics or data collection. You know, without um, maybe that's a conversation to take off line a little bit. Um, Data, data collection, yes. Um, uh, we actually ha uh, developed a method of data acquisition um, that we think is incredibly robust, um, particularly for large scale uh, uh, Turning everything to digital right at the, me at the point of measurement, even if it's an analog measurement, um, and then managing it off the fiber uh, instantly. Um, local places and redundancy, that's novel for what we do. Um, in terms of um, autonomous sensing, um, you're thinking about more robotics. Um, we did explore that a lot. Um, uh, in, in original, originally, ten plus years ago, we worked very closely with um, the Center of Embedded uh, Sensor Networks at UCLA for different types of robotics. Um, and really, what came back in many of our reviews at that point in time, including what came back from the National Science Board, is that uh, while the robotics and the sensing might be actually um, robust enough to consider. The science questions weren't. And so they were basically um, uh, a technology that was waiting for a question. Um, and maybe that's changed today or changed now. Um, and I can give you a specific example of what we proposed to. Okay, let's uh, give uh, Hank and Tom a uh,